This meeting is being recorded. Oh, thank you, Zach. Thanks, babe. We're going to share the vision statement together. We begin. What's that? What's that? I'm not sure what that is. Good. <laughs> it's better if we put ourselves on mute. Those folks at home, it's up on mute. So you're ready to talk. Oh, okay. All right, folks, well, here we go. Together as the church, we will Will you join me in prayer? God, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to just fall uh, deeply on us and within us as we look to your word, as we discuss and seek to understand your word and to put your word uh, into action. God, may our minds be open, our hearts open, our eyes and our ears open to all that you would have to say. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Before you get started, uh, Eric, may I make the suggestion for those of us at home? We yep. should mute. We should mute ourselves at home. There's a lot of distracting noises and we don't realize that's causing some of the feedback and some of the difficulty hearing. So if we mute ourselves and unmute if we want to speak, it'll make it easier for everyone to hear. Helpful suggestion, Wendy, thank you. Thank you. Oh. 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 What is that? It's a dog. Somebody has a dog. Like a bird. I don't know what it is. Eric, you need to mute yourself. Yeah, Jenny, you Eric is muted. Eric has no volume on his. Jenny, what are you I'm muted. No, I'm still on. There you go. Now you got it, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. And that should help us a lot. Thank you. Who was it? <laughs> One of the Jennies. <laughs> All right. Okay. If you would turn in the document we were just looking at, the, the uh, compelling Jesus in the Neighborhood Statement, page seven, please. Beginning at the bottom, we're looking at relationship-based neighborhood engagement. The body of Christ is called to be generous, sharing its resources with those in need. Many congregations, and I think we would we fit the bill here, folks, quickly and enthusiastically gather food, clothing, and other resources to help those who face scarcity in relation to basic physical needs. This vision, this compelling vision, calls us to go beyond meeting physical needs to a place where we, like Jesus Christ, are walking in authentic relationship, relationship friendship, excuse me, with those who share our geographic neighborhoods. This means responding to needs and sharing our resources without partiality, or condescension in the face of any differences, but rather with sensitivity, compassion, respect, and a genuine willingness to learn. It is grounded in deep understanding that every human being stands in equal need of reconciliation with God. And when we have experienced that reconciliation, we become ministers of it through trusting, faithful, long-term relationships with our neighbors. Ed, would you be willing to read the rest of the page? The rest page? Down here. Mm -hmm. 
this is well done by the body of Christ when behavior toward those both within and outside the body consistently and seamlessly embodies the call to love as Jesus Christ loved, making the walls of the church virtually non-existent. In these times, God is calling us to be the denomination challenging its congregations to live out a deep sense of love and care for the body, soul, and spirit of each individual with whom we are privileged to engage and an unmistakable commitment to the overall well-being of the neighborhood. Such a focus brings deeper meaning to the motto which hung above the sour printing press and which many brethren have claimed as their own for the glory of God and our neighbor's good. You'll note the uh, quote, the little quote uh, diagram. When affirming the command to love our neighbor, Jesus was asked the question, and those of you who were a part of Worship Sunday will recall my asking this question, who is my neighbor? It's a question that the body of Christ manifests in individuals and local congregations, districts, and the denomination as a whole is still being asked to wrestle with. This vision is asking us to engage with our neighbors as the hands and the feet and the heart of Christ but also to look for the ways that Jesus is already present in our neighborhoods. Now, if you turn over to page nine, I would like to get a volunteer, if you would, someone to read that uh, quote there in the block, and then someone else to read the part that reads culture. I'll read the quote, Eric. All right, Bob. It is our fervent prayer that God's vision, discerned in community and for our community, will lay claim to our hearts and our minds, our imaginations and our spirits, shaping our identity and inspiring our ministry at the congregational level, the district level, and the denominational level as we wholeheartedly embrace the challenge set before us to share in word and deed the radical transformation and holistic peace of Jesus Christ with individuals, with our neighborhoods, with the world. For as Eugene Peterson says in his paraphrase of Proverbs 29, 18, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what God reveals, they are most blessed. Thank you, Bob. Now, if the person who is willing to read culture would just read uh, to the top of page 10, where it concludes. Do I have a volunteer? We will reorient the entire nature and being, <clears throat> excuse me, we will reorient the entire nature and being of our denomination around a mission. Example, outward focused mindset. To this end, we call every element of our denominational system, mission and ministry board, annual conference agencies, district congregations, to, real, to realign their language, norms, beliefs, symbols, values, and priorities around an external focus to reach persons for Christ and his way of living. We will create a culture of empowerment that encourages and equips the local church to reach persons with a comprehensive message of salvation, declaring Jesus Christ as Lord of all life. It is understood that such a kingdom, it is a, it a it is understood that such a kingdom emphasis summons congregations to respond prophetically, systemically, and globally, even while reaching out locally. We recognize such refocus will, will require loss, but claim the biblical hope that as some things die, there is nevertheless the promise of new life. We further affirm such rebirth is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Thus, we recommit to the renewed denominational language 
of dependence on God's provision and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Thank you, George. Folks, I invite you to keep these pages handy because we may want to refer back to them as we continue in our discussion. But now we're turning to the study guide and for session five here this evening. Note the focus question. Again, it's rhetorical. And it's going to be kind of our guide for this evening. How does the example of Jesus Christ challenge us to build life-changing relationships with our neighbors? Right below that, the focus statement. I'm going to read it because then we're going to jump right into Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah sends a message from God to the exiled community in Babylon. Build houses, plant gardens, have children, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Years later, and we'll get to John in a bit, John tells us that God has seen fit to put on flesh and dwell among us. In Jesus, we see Jeremiah's word come to life as Jesus seeks the welfare of the people. Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 7 from the message is laid right out on our study guide, so I'd like for someone to read that, if you would, please. Someone out there in virtual Eric, land. Eric, I'll read it. Okay. Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 7 from the message. This is the message from God of the angel armies, Israel's God, to all the exiles I've taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and make yourselves at home. Put in gardens and eat what grows in the country. Marry and have children. Encourage your children to marry and have children so, to that, so that you'll thrive in that country and not waste away. Make yourselves at home there and work for the country's welfare. Pray for Babylon's well-being. If things go well for Babylon, things will go well for you. I'd like to insert something, if I may, before we begin the discussion. How about that last sentence, if we read it? Play, pray for Central's neighborhood. If things go well for Central's neighborhood, things will go well for Central. <laughs> Our interpretation of that. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Jeremiah tells the Israelites exiled in Babylon to seek the welfare of the city where they will prosper. So first question for discussion this evening, how easy is it for you, is it, how easy is it for me to make ourselves at home in a new situation with new people? How easy is it or how hard is it? pretty hard for folks like me that are truly introverts. It's hard to make myself have conversations with strangers. I've learned as I've matured how to have a conversation like that, but I'm never comfortable. So I really have to force that on myself. Okay, appreciate that, sister. Thank you. You have to be willing to take a risk and stick your neck out um, because you have to Sometimes you have to make the first move and maybe it's accepted and maybe it's not. Is what Wendy said reflective of American culture? What do you think, Wendy? No, I think I'm, I mean, I know there are introverts and extroverts, but I think a lot of America, particularly generations younger than me are getting bolder and bolder. And maybe it's kind of done behind a screen, behind technology, but I, I just find even in my school setting that that people just, just talk, I think more freely, but I, I don't know, maybe that's just my, my realm, you know, in a school setting. I can't get my teenagers to ever be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, George, Vicki. Yeah, I think this is more about to me, what the scripture is talking about is putting out roots so that you are a part of that community. And I think, uh, I think in generations, we are less that way. I look back, my parents' generation, my parents lived a, a mile from each other, grew up in the same church. You know, I look back at their relatives, they married 
maybe somebody a few miles away, but they were committed to that community because they weren't going anywhere else. My, my, my dad who went to seminary was kind of the uh, exception to the rule in his family. Um, and he drug us around quite a few places. Um, I think it, and if you feel like you're going to leave, you're not committed. You have to, this whole thing about plant your garden, have your children there. That mean, that talks about commitment to a community, which I think is the key. Thank you for that. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, I think I agree with you, Vicki, that not everybody, but in years past, people didn't move around as much as people are moving around today. Um, you know, my family started in Bucks County, Pennsylvania in the 1700s, and most of them are still there until my generation and the one below me where we're scattered across the country at this point. And although I think even some people who've been in, co in communities all their lives don't know people. I mean, I think it's kind of also a personality thing. Whereas, you know, some people have been there five years, know everybody. Um, Any other thoughts, folks? Other reflections? I wonder, I wonder if, uh, it's kind of going back to what Vicki was saying in a sense, I wonder how much of this dis-ease that we might feel about engaging with others has to do with the sort of sense of individualism that seems to permeate our society and the fact that we kind of live in silos um, that you know we're not out there um, actively mixing up with those who are different it's interesting as you drive around older parts of cities older houses have porches. The newer subdivisions do not have porches. And I think that's symbolic of how we've changed in the way that we're talking about. Air conditioning probably had as much to do with that as anything. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of piggyback on what uh, Wendy had to say because I'm an introvert as well. And it is, Wendy, I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. It's really hard for me when I'm in a group of particularly a lot of people I don't know, maybe I've never met before. That's a very, very uncomfortable space for me. And I have to literally make myself um, try to engage another person in conversation. And it occurred to me this morning as I was reading over this that perhaps I need to always remind myself that other people in that room may be just as uncomfortable as me. <laughs> and if I can try to get my focus off of me and how uncomfortable I am um, and just reach out to another person, you know, they might be, they might be grateful for that. Um, I just want to go. No, I was just gonna, um, I was gonna say, um, I, this seems pretty simplistic, but I find myself smiling at people. I, I sort of make it a game in a way to smile at it just, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, and, and to see if they'll smile back. And I feel like if you're friendly and visually and you smile, then it certainly is more, it opens you up and opens people up to you more easily than if you just kind of sit and look around and keep your head down. It's just, you know, a smile is, it, it brings all kinds of response. Yeah, in different, thank you for that, Emily, because I think in different cultures, making eye contact can mean one thing, but I think 
mm -hmm. here in our culture, I think it, it indicates a willingness and an openness just to be engaged when we make eye contact. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. We're going to have an opportunity at Central to really be a part of our neighborhood uh, on April 9th. The Church Women United is, has something that's coming called the Ten Commandments Walk, and they're walking from church to church in the, our area, and they wanted to make a stop at Central. So that's an opportunity to be central in our neighborhood on this. It's April 9th. I think it's a Saturday. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Oh, I want to go back to what Emily said, because I think that is very accurate. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've been in a work situation where every job I had put me in a group of people that I knew no one. And many times the cultures were very different. Um, going from Brownsville, Texas, where everyone is Hispanic, up to New York, where everybody is Nordic, and the <laughs> situations are very different. But if you act friendly and smile, people come around a lot easier than, and it gets easier for me to interact with folks I don't know. Okay, thank you. And I guess I'm lucky, because I think I have a common face Many people who I don't know think they know me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I always say, well, no, I don't think that. you know me. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> could, we, uh, could I invite someone to read John 114 as it's printed right here on our study guide? I'll read it. Thank you. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. Thanks, Harry. So where might we find Jesus in our neighborhood? And what would he be doing? Packing bag boxes of food at the uh, food bank. That's one. Cleaning, cleaning the snow from your neighbor's driveway. All right, all right. <laughs> yeah, I think you would find him uh, uh, with people that uh, aren't necessarily the most highly respected in society, maybe even um, those who are neglected and dispossessed. So you might find them at the rescue mission or the women's shelter or the Salvation Army, um, places yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see Jesus engaging the uh, person standing in the meeting at a traffic intersection. I see Jesus engaging that person in conversation and perhaps meeting the needs of whatever that person, I mean, I should say perhaps, meeting the needs of that person, whatever that person's needs are. Where else do we see Jesus in the neighborhood? Last week, I stayed after school to supervise a basketball game between my middle school and another middle school. And there were there was a lot of contention in the bleacher. Mm. <laughs> We're there to support the children on either side. Of course, I want my school to win, but when the other team is playing well, you're excited for them. They're just middle schoolers learning a new sport, but we've got parents <laughs> or some relatives screaming and yelling at the referees and calling out. I know that some games, the parents have used cursing words i didn't hear that last week but i feel like jesus is sitting on the bleachers mm. and we've got to figure out how to interact when obviously i don't approve of the way people are speaking so yeah he's right there in the midst of the basketball game <laughs> yeah and yeah i think at times he would just be sitting on a park bench by himself I mean, he did have a sense, too, that mm -hmm. there were times we all need to be 
by ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Either directly or indirectly participating in a Narcotics Anonymous program. Uh -huh. Or Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh -huh. program. Uh -huh. Okay. Any others? Uh, Jackson invited me to go to the all district band concert last Sunday at K Spring. And there were children there from all different backgrounds, all different areas of our community from Martinsville up to, um, well, I don't know where the parameters are, but there, it was a large parameter. And everybody was so enthusiastic and got along and were, they were there to celebrate what those kids were doing. And I could see Jesus in that audience too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think Jesus is everywhere that we're willing to look. Or willing to be. Or willing to be. And I think Jesus would be talking with people, just hanging out with people, eating with people, playing, um, maybe sitting on that bench, just, you know, yeah. So, to, so then it would follow that the places we're not willing to be, mm -hmm. we limit where Jesus can be. Right. And those may be the very places Jesus is call, trying to call us mm -hmm. to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, <clears throat> Jesus is there waiting for us when we are talking earlier about engaging other people. Mm -hmm. I think Jesus is sometimes just waiting to help us do that. I know in my case, I'm a little like Emily. I, I find it kind of fun to smile at people and to, uh, to uh, uh, say something perhaps unexpected. Of course, uh, Harry and Becky recognize I'm a big sports fan. If I see a person, whatever the race, and wearing a, uh, a team sweatshirt, a lot of times that just gives me an opportunity to say something. And, and many times they're shocked. And I know many times Darlene is shocked. I embarrass her in a lot of cases. We go into a tire shop, man comes in with a Steelers shirt. I say something to him. Uh, of course, he happens to be a black man. Uh, we go to Elmwood Park, uh, or used to before COVID, to see a lot of the uh, uh, beach music and leave in Elmwood Park because there's a homeless man on a bench. I sit down and talk to him. And uh, the. Uh, I don't know. I find it quite satisfying. I feel like Jesus is helping me out because of one thing that I find, these people open up and some of them feel very important when just because and I love talking to waitresses. And of course, I watched the video earlier with uh, uh, where Kevin said made some reference to uh, cashiers and checkout people. I love waitresses and, and you know, I'm a blue collar man myself. I just love to engage the the, the people that might not feel so very important. I like to help them feel important. Thanks, Randy. Yes. I would, if I may, I would just say it's not Jesus. I, I think it's not Jesus helping you. I think that's Jesus in you. <laughs> yes. Yes. In faith and action, we learned to try to call the people that wait on us as cashiers by name. And so I try to remember to do that. I don't always do that. And sometimes their name tags are such I can't see them, read them. But that's also a, an empowering thing to do is to call those people by name. Mm This next passage that we're looking at this evening from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through chapter 6, verse 10 is somewhat lengthy. So I'm going to read this one. And because our other two this evening have been from the message, I'm choosing to read it from the message as well. 
So hang with me. I'm actually going to begin one verse earlier. I'm going to begin with verse uh, 15. Our firm, this section is entitled A New Life. Our firm decision is to work from this focus center. Focus center is this. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life. A resurrection life. A life far better than people ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we do not evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that, want, that way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone. A new life burgeons. Look at it. All this comes from God, the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness for sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. But how, you say? In Christ. God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so that we would be put right with God. Companions, as we are in this work with you, we beg you, please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life that God has given us. God reminds us, I heard your call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Well, now is the right time to listen, the day to be helped. Don't put it off. Don't frustrate God's work by showing up late, throwing a question mark over everything we're doing. Our work as God's servants gets validated or not in the details. People are watching us as we stay at our post, alertly, unswervingly, be that in hard times, tough times, bad times. When we're beaten up, jailed, mobbed, working hard, working late, working without eating, a pure heart, clear head, steady hand, and gentleness, holiness, and honest love. When we're telling the truth and when God's showing his power, when we're doing our best, setting things right, when we're praised and when we're blamed, slandered and honored, true to our word, though distrusted, ignored by the world, but recognized by God, terrifically alive, though rumored to be dead, beaten within an inch of our lives, but refusing to die, immersed in tears, yet always filled with deep joy, living on handouts, yet enriching many, having nothing, having it all. So the question for us, and this is why I wanted to keep us to keep the um, compelling vision statement handy, the part that we read earlier, we may want to go back to it, this is a big question. How is God calling us to reshape the underlying culture of our life together? Eric? Uh-huh. I'm going to do an unbrethren thing and brag just a moment. I think our banners have helped us outwardly share what our new ideas have been evolving into. And I think in our packet, page nine, it said to realign our language, norms, beliefs, symbols, values, and priorities around an external focus. Hmm. Reach persons for Jesus Christ and his other way of living. 
obviously we want to put action behind our statements, our pictures, our symbols, but I think that is one very strong outward way. We're letting people know who we are. Amen. Amen. Thank you for naming that. I believe that it's absolutely wrong, spot on. Can I go back to something Randy said earlier? Please. Uh, what he was talking about is validating people who don't ever see validation in their lives. And that is such an important component to change people's mindset and how they think about not only themselves about but about the world around them they have not been validated and it doesn't have to be homeless people uh, if I'm running a workshop and a, a person stands up and shares a very personal story and I go right ahead with what I'm wanting to do and ignore what he or she said they have not been validated and they're going, why in the world did I share that? Yeah, amen. I think people really need validation. And I think that's something that is very easy to give. Yeah, so much so. Thank you, God. Hey, Wendy. And something ahead. as simple as making eye contact, smiling, calling the server or the cashier or whoever by name. It, I think is a way of saying, I see you. Oh, yeah. You are a person of worth to me. Um, yeah, it's it's a very small thing, but it's so important. In the um, in the discussion uh, or in the uh, commentary under this discussion question we're looking at right now, there's a. Uh, an apostrophe around the word culture or an asterisk, excuse me. The culture of a group, organization, or society is defined as its shared practices, attitudes, values, and goals. Wendy, you alluded to the fact that our, I think, if I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I think I heard you say maybe our culture is changing a little bit. Is that, is that a correct uh, hearing? Well, you have to realize I'm coming from an adolescent perspective most of the time. Um, there are obviously adults in my building. And I have probably made this comment before in Sunday school class. The adults in my building are about as unfriendly as you can get. I'm not saying they're, they're uh, rude, although I kind of think so when people walk by you and they don't speak. So I find that they're very closed off when we're in person and just passing each other in the hallway. But the teenagers themselves are definitely being outspoken and, and sharing their thoughts all the time. But, you know, kids, kids, yeah, their perspective is different and it will change as they, you know, grow. I guess where I'm coming with where I'm gonna go with this is how, those of you who have been a part of Central for a, a good while, and those of us who are newer, how, how would you define our culture as a, as a congregation? What words would you use to define our culture? Optimistic. <laughs> I optimistic um, and open-minded, whoever just said that, that um, willing to take a risk where before I don't think we, we were as a congregation willing to take risks. Okay. Okay. The congregational statement on racism was a risky endeavor uh, because culturally not everyone would probably agree with that. So we are dealing with reparations. We could list numerous things where, I don't know if you'd say we're trailblazers or we're doing things outside of the norm, certainly. And um, 
but I don't know how the rest of the, even the brethren community uh, views this, but it is sort of out there on the limb. I mean, we're validated in that we believe it's right. We certainly acknowledge it and go with it. But still, it's, it is a little bit of a gray area. It's a new thing. A new thing. And I think we are leading Oak Grove. They are taking baby steps. They're certainly a bigger church and they're not as cohesive in thought, but there is a good group there that is um, interested in what we're doing and in pursuing it as well. So I think we're giving some other folks some courage. This is not meant to be a joke, but it sort of is. <laughs> I was on a meeting with David this week and uh, our committee group, we discussed many things and, and the race education team came up and how congregations are perceiving that. And David starts laughing. He said, you wouldn't believe some of the calls I've got. I've actually had phone calls over that wondering if the district is getting involved in mass car racing. Race education? <laughs> That's right. Well, everybody laughed, but he said it, it's happened twice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and <laughs> so, even that, I mean, as innocent as it may seem, it, it's an educational thing. It's a new thing for people to have to deal with. Yeah. We're so many of our groups, culture is so centered around. NASCAR racing, that when they hear about the church involved in race education, if they don't involve themselves in it, that's, that's what comes to their mind. So he's had to field questions and explanations over that very thing. <laughs> so you're being literal, George, when you say that, that they literally think that we're talking about NASCAR race racing? The, the two phone calls did. And, it, and I may add, it was from the southern area of the district. <laughs> well, right, 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 around, right around the Callaway racetrack, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think the phone call was taken with the sincerity that the individual was talking about. It's hard to believe, but folks, that's where we are. Well, thanks for bringing that up. That's great. That's really great. Oh my I, have, goodness. I have a feeling they were probably very disappointed. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they found they found that is funny. You just can't make this up. Well, you just can't. Yeah. I, we've heard from we've heard from We've heard from a couple of our brethren um, oh about our culture. I, I'd be interested to hear what some others think. Because the next question that we're, might as well go there, it's on the last page of our study for the day. How do you imagine the culture that God is leading? How do you imagine, how do you foresee, or how do you, you know, the word imagine, how do you see the culture that God is leading us to develop? What's it looking like? What's it going to look like? I want like? to put Randy and Darlene on the spot, but they're the, sort of the newest here, and I'm just curious how they view the culture of our church, if they're willing to answer. You can always take a pass when you're put on the spot. We can just ask for more time, too, right? You can do that. Too. A little delay. Okay. Obviously friendly, welcoming, open. I wasn't searching. For, I wasn't searching for compliments, but I just <laughs> was curious because you know you guys came in and maybe saw us in a way that we don't realize how we are being projected how we project ourselves so if there's some areas that we need to focus on to do better please let us know even not if not maybe not now but sometime or other well, we're talking about culture changing um the church of the brethren culture has been changing from the beginning 
Um, and I think it will continue to change. I think that's part of its growth is being able to change. I think part of our culture at Central will need to embrace the, the world of technology more than we have. Um, certainly we're providing uh, an online platform for many of our programs and services like this one tonight. And I, I think maybe some of us have thought, oh, it'll go back to the old way once you know we can all get back together. But I, I, I don't see that. And I think it's important to continue to offer what we have because we think it's good in a, in a way that other people can join us, even if it means we are not together in the same room at the same time. So I, I think technology is, is gonna drive a lot of what we do. Thanks, Wendy. I wanna go back to Nancy. Andy, Nancy, unmute yourself, would you please? Yes, sir. I, I didn't thank you and I appreciate what you had to say, but I wanna, I wanna I just want to not press you personally, I just want to press what you said a little bit. I think you're right. The culture of the Church of the Brethren has continued to change. Um, and you said, I think, did you say something about growing? I think you can't grow if you don't change. Okay, that's okay. Uh, that's what I want to make sure I understood right. Because I don't, I think part of our decline, if not even demise, is that has been our unwillingness to change. Mm -hmm. when I married when I married this lady to my left and came into the church of the brethren uh, by by baptism rebaptism um, I think at that time the church of the brethren denominationally was about 210,000 strong and that would have been in 1970 and now we're at a little less than 100,000 so, uh, I mean, there's a number, any number of reasons why those numbers have, have dropped, but I think, again, personally, you know, a lot of it has been on our willingness, our unwillingness to change, and the fact that the church is always playing catch up, it seems like, with uh, society. I also think that Central's willingness to change or um, interest in changing has um decreased attendance but i think in the long run that will increase attendance one of the reasons one of the reasons why people attend churches is they want something safe and secure in a world that's constantly changing some people view that their church life is the, a constant a sort of a, a bulwark never failing as as the hymn says well, but so they're very disappointed if there's change because they want this constant thing that, that's comfortable. That's what they've what they maybe what they may perhaps remember from their youth or or happier times. And yet we're called to be revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. But that's a, the church attracts a lot of those folks, and so probably more so than the broader current. Uh, con you know, culture at, at large is we have a lot of people who, in a sense, are conservative, not in the sense of political conservative, but conservative in the, in the idea that they don't want change, that they want to hold on to something. Yeah. Of course, we want to hold on to something too, but our view of Jesus in the neighborhood is not the same thing as their idea of something that remains the same over and over, you know, for, for decades. Thank you, Harry. Well, I, I think that I was in a conversation today on email with somebody about a, a congregation that's not anywhere near us that's uh, about to vote to leave the Church of the Brethren. And, and as I've watched our congregations over the years, I think we have not put enough emphasis on what brethren do believe. I mean, we, we uh, you know, we vote for our own pastors. It doesn't matter where they come from. I mean, I have two sisters who are bright and often on the search committee at their church looking at a new pastor. And I'll say, 
And where did he get his ministry training? And they have no idea, no idea. And so right now they have a graduate of Jerry Falwell's seminary near us. Um, you know, the, there's a fine line between making decisions on our own. Of course, we don't have a creed except the New Testament. That leaves us wide open to all kinds of things. But, but I think we're, we're seeing right now some of the downside of that sort of polity in the Church of the Brethren in that, you know, we have in our effort to try to attract new members, I think too many of us have forgotten what's important about being Church of the Brethren as opposed to being Baptist or Methodist or whatever. Uh, we, we've kind of watered ourselves down quite a bit, in my opinion. Thanks, Marilyn. Maybe that's part of the problem. We don't really know what brethren is. And yet the brethren, you know, way back when in the early part of them coming into this country were extremely radical, but boy, they drew people by the hundreds. I mean, you know, they were, they were very different, but I think sometimes we're, afraid of being different. Um, yeah. I think one of the strengths of this uh, compelling vision is that it, it puts an emphasis on community rather than on the individual. And it seems to me that if there's any one principle that's so critical of Jesus' teachings, it's that to put others first. Annette, and thank you for that, Harry, and, and Marilyn, because uh, as I think about Alexander Mack's symbol, uh, the symbol attributed to Mack was about community, the German word Gemeinschaft or something yeah. to that effect. Gemeinschaft. Yeah. yeah. All right, folks, any other, any other um, comments, questions, suggestions, critiques? Oh. George got to tell a joke. I get to tell a joke. <laughs> I just before I, I do. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a comment uh, to the last question. How do you imagine the culture that God is leading us to develop? Um, I hope God's leading us to develop a culture that's much less punitive. Mm. Um, I'm sorry, much less one. Much less punitive, oh, punitive as we as we think about God and how God interacts with God's people. Um, much less punitive, much less judgmental. And man, I, we've got a ways to go, I'm afraid. Um, and much more grace and mercy filled. You know, we've lost our belief in universal restoration that in the end that god will restore everything mm -hmm. and uh, we'd rather many of us see god judging well right. that person's gonna right they'll find out one of these days what the ins and the outs yeah. and the you know uh yeah who, who god's gonna accept and who god's gonna condemn so we we want to remember that we are all god's children and God's going to take care of all of his children. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We are going to help take care of all God's children, too. That's right. That's right. The hands and feet. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right, folks. Thank you. Next week will be the final session. It's going to cover a lot. So um, just a heads up. We're going to talk about being called and equipped, becoming innovative and adaptable and fearless. Is it, that's not enough to cover in one session. Wow. Couldn't okay. they have put more in that last session? <laughs> well, I ain't the person put it together. I guess. All right. <laughs>
How many brethren does it change? How many? Oh, sorry, Vicki. I want to hold my joke yet. Okay. Okay. I just I just wanted to mention and offer congratulations to Joy and her family who welcomed uh, Adam. Um, and as he got his uh, certification to be a firefighter and is, I believe, now employed in Botetourt. He came through the same class. I understand that, um, well, I don't need somebody else. I know. Anyway, I'm missing you. Break it up. Very, very proud of, of Adam Murray's accomplishment and becoming a firefighter and passing that. And is he, uh, did you, where did you Thank say, you. Roanoke or in Botetourt? But he's I in, think, go ahead, Joy. He's in Botetourt. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Woohoo! Yay! <laughs> Congratulations, yay! Yeah. All right, here's the joke, and then we're going to pray. How many, <laughs> how many brethren does it take to change a light bulb? Change, change. Change <laughs> that light bulb, it's been in our family for years. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, you all know that joke. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to have us close with the prayer that's the end of our study for this evening. Um, I'm learning, even as we go, that it's really hard for us to do things in unison. So I'm going to offer the prayer, but you please uh, pray to yourself as I, as I offer it. This aloud. is a wonderful prayer. Oh, God of fire and freedom. I'm going to make it corporate. Oh, God of fire and freedom, deliver us from our bondage to what can be counted and go with us in the new exodus towards what counts, but can only be measured in bread shared and swords becoming plowshares in bodies healed and minds liberated in songs sung and justice done in laughter in the night and joy in the morning in love through all seasons and with great gladness of heart. In all people coming together and a kingdom coming in your glory and in your name being praised and my becoming, our becoming, an alleluia through Jesus to Christ. And God's people could all say together, Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you, Eric. Thank, thank you. Eric. Good night. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Zach. George, before you go here. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I was on Facebook today, and there was this ad for a cruise. It was a big ship. And there was this couple.